All right. Well, I haven't done this in a few weeks. I'll see if I can still remember how to do this, huh? If you've, got, if you've got your Bible with you, that's great. I know very few of you do. But if you have a Bible app, that's perfect. Okay, so you just open up your phone and go to a Bible app. And for a moment, I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 21. You're like, Jim, it's September 1st, first week back. You're taking us to Deuteronomy. Only for a moment. Only for a moment. And believe me, it gets worse. Okay. This autumn, we are going to be doing a series called Hashtag Confused. There is much about Christianity that confuses people because there are many people who are a part of Christianity. And anything that has a lot of people ends up becoming a bit like trying to corral cats. And it gets difficult. And different takes, different ideas, different, different theories get, begin to get into the mix. And so what I wanted to do was create a safe space for us to be able to talk about things that confuse us. Now, in saying that, I want to issue an invitation. I would love for you to send me anything that you personally are wrestling with that you would love us to address on one of the weeks. I promise I won't use your name as the person who asked the question. You can be completely anonymous. Um, you can just email me, jim at canterburyvineyard.com. If there's something you're hashtag confused about, well, email me and we'll see. It might be one of the things that we talk about. And I know I sound like a 55-year-old man trying to sound like a 20-year-old saying hashtag confused, but live with it, okay? <laughs> I'm down with the kids. And if you aren't, that's your problem. No, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we've got some stuff lined up already, but I would love to be able to have some guidance as to all the stuff we're going to dig into, all right? And, and I, already, I can already tell at least a couple of the questions that are going to come. They're inevitable. This week, I, this week and next week, I want to start with something that is connected to another initiative we're launching this autumn. Um, I want to talk about what makes Christianity unique. Now, when I use the word Christianity, I'm not talking about the world religion that's called Christianity. I'm talking the movement of Jesus, of people who are following Jesus by the power of the Spirit worldwide. Okay? There's a difference. Those are two different entities. The worldwide religion called Christianity versus the movement of Jesus that is inhabited by people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and are following Jesus into their daily lives. That might be news to some of you this morning, that those two things aren't the same. Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes they don't. But what makes the movement of Jesus, Christianity, a unique movement on the face of the earth? You know, there's a lot of problem that people have with the issue of Christian exclusivism. You know, Christianity is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That is offensive in a multicultural society. Well, what everyone fails to realize is that every world religion of any note is likewise exclusive. There is an exclusivity in every faith path. And what makes Christianity's take different? Now, this week and next week, I want to talk about that. And I, I'm going to give you a hint. It begins with G. And it ends with E. And there's an R-A-C in the middle. It's grace. It's grace. Grace is uniquely found in the movement of Jesus. And we are going to offer, see, we want everyone to be able to be a part of community. Not only this Sunday morning gathered community, but a much smaller expression of that. And so Pauline next week is going to be presenting to you numerous options that we've tried to line out for you. And one of those options is that we are going to offer something called the Grace Course. And it's going to kind of flow out of this Sunday and next Sunday's talks. And it's going to be a number of weeks fortnightly on Zoom that we're going to be doing and in person throughout the whole autumn. And I'm going to be hosting that. 
And what we're going to do is we are going to unpack that miracle called grace. That miracle in the pages of Scripture from the mouth of our Savior called grace. And one of the realities is if your Christianity is not thrilling you, compelling you, moving you, my guess is it probably has become something where grace has slipped and the miracle is less miraculous. And it's helpful to allow that to be put back in its proper orbit in your heart and watch the explosions begin. Because Christianity is an explosion that's triggered by grace. It's a passion that's triggered by his affection. It is not rituals, activities, rhythms. It's none of those things. It is a chain reaction. And so hopefully I've captured your imagination. This is core DNA to us as a family. If, if grace is something that you kind of got, but it's not thrilling you, then you need to be a part of this conversation this autumn, okay? Uh, we're going to, again, run this annually as well so that this bit of DNA is preserved. So Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 to 21. I'm going to start here because the main chunk of Scripture I'm just going to unpack for us this morning is um, a response on Jesus' part to this bit of Scripture, all right? How many of you were parents? Okay. Okay. How many of you were ever children of parents? Oh, okay. So we've got, we've got pretty much between the two categories, unanimity. All right. So I just want you to uh, experience it as one, of the, uh, one or the other here this morning, okay? So Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 to 21. I'm reading from the New American Standard which is a little bit more wooden, but also a little bit more true to the original language. And here it is. Verse 18. If any person has a stubborn and rebellious son, do we have any, or daughter, do we have any stubborn or rebellious sons or daughters here? Yes, we have a few of those, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, dear. You don't know what's coming next. Who does not obey his father or her father or his mother or her mother. And when they discipline him or her, he or she does not listen to them. Then this son or daughter's father and mother shall seize him or her. And bring him or her out to the elders of his city at the gate of his hometown. And the parents shall, sh shall say to the elders of the city, this son or daughter of ours is stubborn and rebellious. What's interesting is that in the original Hebrew, that can also be translated a glutton and a drunkard, which is what they called Jesus. Interesting. He does not obey us. She does not obey us. He or she is thoughtless and given to drinking. Verse 21, prepare yourself. You got your seatbelts on? Then all the men of the city shall stone him or her to death. Well, that went, went, that went a different direction, didn't it? That, that, okay. So you shall eliminate the evil from your midst, and all Israel will hear about it and fear. Okay, so when you're talking with your friends at, at work over the water cooler this coming week, and they say, so what did you talk about at sun, uh, Sunday at church? said, well, we talked about stoning rebellious children. <laughs> Do you want to come next week with me? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> what on earth? Right? These are the hashtag confused moments that sometimes we encounter in Scripture, and Jesus' response to it 
is mind-blowing. Okay? Now, many of you won't know this because I didn't know it for many years, and it's just not commonly talked about, but the parable of the prodigal son is Jesus' response to this law. You see, Jesus was called a glutton and a drunkard. And the parable of the prodigal son was a response to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who were criticizing Jesus' lifestyle of welcoming rebellious sons and daughters. And they say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Now, a little background. There is no historical record that this law was ever followed in ancient Israel. Likewise, in ancient Mesopotamia, where Israel was located, to read this is to read extreme limitations on the authority of parents. First of all, a father could honor kill any of his children at will, and there would not be judgment for that, especially for disobedience. It was, an all, it was a tyrannical authority in that moment in human history. So what we see when we read verses 18 to 21 in light of its context is that Yahweh, in his law, is bringing limitation to practices that were horrific. It is not that you should stone. God's not setting this up so that the children get stoned. It's, that word has been so misused that I'm going to be thinking of that too every time I say that word, okay? But just work with me, okay? But he is actually trying to create a pathway that is redemptive, that draws the children off of that path. So when the father and mother, well, that's unheard of in ancient Mesopotamia, that the mother would get a say that she would have to agree to go to the elders of the city gate, that's enormous. So not only the father, but now the mother have to be in agreement that this child is a glutton and a drunkard and rebellious. And then when they take him to the city gate, it's not just so that it can happen, it's so that the elders can speak into the situation and bring guidance. And hopefully this child can be redeemed, rescued, and brought back onto a path of life. So really what we see here in its historical context is a limiting law that's trying to draw. If you read the Old Testament, often what you'll find is that God is on the redemptive side of that moment in history trying to draw it towards goodness, draw it towards beauty, one step at a time. But we, in 21st century Western culture, read that and go, whoa, But in historical context, you got to understand, he's trying to draw that towards something far less cruel. Does that make sense, everybody? Is that a bit much? All right, so let's let's go to the parable of the prodigal son. That is found in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, and it begins in verse 11. Now, many, who's who's ever heard teaching on the parable of the prodigal son? Yes, of course. It is, it is probably the most taught on parable. But, and in fact, I just did something on it at the carol service last December. But I felt like this is where we were to begin. To see how Jesus applies what we just read from Deuteronomy into a real life context is meant to reveal to you the nature of your God. What's God like? Well, you have some people over here going, he's a consuming fire. And we got people over here going, he's a loving daddy. And the truth is in scripture, he's both. But how does that work out in a real life, in a real context? Some of us are hashtag confused. Going to keep going. Verse 11, okay? So whip over on your Bible. So verse 11 of Luke chapter 15. And we're just going to go down, and I'm just going to comment. We're going to try and quickly blast through this, my friends, so that we can then pray for each other. Hmm. So Jesus is loving on the 
the lost and the and the and the sinners and the gluttons and the drunkards and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are horrified. Why is he doing this? And he tells three parables, and this is the third one. Verse 11. And Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that is coming to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. It's crucially important that you understand that in this moment, this is incredibly offensive. First of all, it's the younger son, all right, who wasn't the natural heir. And second of all, he's saying, even though you're alive, I want my share of the estate. So what he's saying is, I just, I wish you'd die. It is a profound offense. But this is a headstrong child. This is a rebellious child that wants to do things his own way. Give me my share. I cannot wait until you are dead and out of my life. I want to be in charge of my life. Right? That's what's being communicated. And then it says this. And so he divided his wealth between them. So first of all, everyone listening to this story is like, huh? Because they all thought a trip to the city gate was in store. But the father does it. Why does the father do it? So he divided his wealth. Free will. You serve a God that wants you to choose him. God wants children who want him. And he will not force himself on anyone. He will woo. He will draw. He will whisper he will reach out. He will run for them. But he will not force himself on anyone. Free will is essential to genuine love. Verse 13. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together. So he didn't waste any time. He gets his money, gets all his belongings, and went on a journey to a distant country. To a distant country. that You need to know that that's very important because... In this day and age, the location of God was Israel. So to go to a distant country was to go out from underneath the protection of God. To actually walk into the land ruled by foreign gods. So when he goes to a distant country, that's an enormous choice. And there he squandered his estate in wild living. Many of you may wonder where the word prodigal comes from. That's the word there, wild living. That, that word actually can be translated prodigal living. Okay, so that's why he's the prodigal son. You could call it the, prod the parable of the wild son just as easily. Wild living, living prodigally or extravagantly wasteful or, does this word help, debauched. You guys know that word debauched? It's kind of an oldie but a goodie. You just picture it, okay, debauched. Verse 14, now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began doing without. So he was probably given a good amount, but Jesus doesn't even say if he spent everything. He says when. And here's the reality, my friends. We all do. We all come to a moment that captures our brokenness and leaves us in a space that is nothing but need. We have many in our lives where our resources just simply run out. And those are pregnant spiritual moments. In our consumer Western culture, they are the worst possible nightmare. And we quickly do everything we can to escape those moments. But those are the moments full with spiritual potential and possibility. You see, that moment where he spent everything is an experience common to all of us, where we come to the end of ourself. And then it says this, at that same moment, a severe famine occurred in that country. Severe famines, recessions. Stock market collapses. It happens, doesn't it? 
this world is a broken place. And this world asks questions of us. Things don't go to plan in this world, do they? I don't know if any of you are experiencing that right now in your life. I certainly experienced that within the last decade of my existence. But things happen. Medical diagnoses come in. Financial hardships come. Job loss. Death of loved ones. These things happen. Unemployment. Betrayal of a close friend. A severe famine occurs in every country because this is a broken world. And you better have an approach to life that is able to stay alive with a capital A in the midst of famines or you're in deep doo-doo because this life is filled with famines. The problem is our young prodigal son had built a life in a way that couldn't sustain a severe famine. So in verse 15, he says this, So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and this citizen sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Now again, many of you will be aware of this, but this is a horrific image. All of Jesus' Jewish listeners are horrified. They're like, Right, I, I, I couldn't probably use a taboo in our culture that is the equivalent of what that would have done to the listeners to this story. He hired himself out. The verb here means to glue or cement. It's a very expressive word picture implying that the prodigal son forced himself upon the citizen who was unwilling to hire him and who took him into his service only upon persistent entreaty. He just wore the guy down, and the guy flying went, fine, sleep where the pigs are. There's no generosity. There's no welcome. And some of you have experienced that in this world. There's very little loyalty. There's very little generosity. It's a hard place where loyalty, where people who you thought would be there for you aren't there for you. And he experiences this moment, and he says, oh, I'm just, I need a place to stay. Please, please, please. And the reality is he's not welcome. He experiences a profound lack of welcome, actually. It's begrudging because the man begged to do any work, even the lowest. So, of course, this citizen gives him the lowest work. Even in a distant country, feeding the pigs was the bottom of the barrel. But literally, working with pigs was unclean in Jewish culture, and it was a horrific thing. And... You couldn't get lower. As he had received him reluctantly, so he gave him the meanest possible employment, an ignominious occupation. I'm reading a quote here. I don't tend to use the word ignominious very often in my language, especially in Jewish eyes. The keeping of pigs was prohibited to Israelites under a curse. The world, when we are in its clutches, defiles us. The world, when we have come to the end of ourselves and we have put all of our cachet in, what, in this world system to try to give us life and give us joy and give us hope, and we are in its clutches, it defiles us. Verse 16. Are we still there? Are we okay? Turn to the person next to you and ask, are you still okay? Yes, all right, great. You're doing well. You're doing well. I'm cranking. I'm already at verse 16, guys, okay? And here, this is, this is where he gets, it's actually one step lower. And he longed to have his fill of the carob pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. <laughs> he was below the pigs now. He wanted to eat what they ate. His standards, his expectations of life had come so low that he even wanted to eat what the pigs were eating. Your expectations will lower. 
based upon your vision of what you've been created for. Verse 17, but when he came to his senses, that's so cool, when he came to his senses. In the Greek, it just says this, when he came to himself, when he realized who he was, when he realized what he was created for, when he realized actually that he was a child of God, that he was worth more than this, that the the path that he had chosen had defiled him and taken him to the very bottom of the barrel. And that he had somehow lost an understanding of who he was and what he was created for and why he was on this planet. Okay? When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired laborers have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here from hunger. This phrase, when he came to his senses, is wonderfully suggestive. The man's guilt was that he had been self-indulgent. But he had been living to a self which was not his true self. The first step in repentance is to awake as if out of an evil dream. And become conscious of your genuine identity. This is is the the angle I tend to take with people who, who... don't have a faith in a God of any sort, and we get into a conversation, I tend to actually begin to ask questions about their identity and who they think they are. Because inevitably, this world skews the identity in a horrid way. And it's only the love of a miraculous Father in heaven that is able to restore identity to the place it's meant to be. And there's something in all of us that are still in touch with that identity. No matter how far away from God we've gone, there's something that stirs when you begin to call out that identity in somebody. There's something in them that goes, that sounds familiar. I think I seem to remember the voice in the back of my head of a daddy who loved me. A purpose I was created for that was bigger than just self. Identity, that is one of the key ways with our generation. And then he says this, how many of my father's hired laborers have more than enough? Basically, he's realizing, you know what? My dad's a pretty good guy, and I was an idiot. He takes care of his hired laborers, and here I am, a hired laborer, and I won't even be given food such that I'm starving for the pig feed. My dad is good. Wow. Why did I ever leave? And then verse 20 says this. Verse 18, I'm sorry. Let me just finish. Verse 18, I will set out and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. So he's rehearsing his speech. I have sinned against heaven and to your face. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, so far, so good. This is genuine repentance. I messed up. And I not only insulted God, who instituted you as a good and loving authority in my life, but I insulted you to your face. I'm so sorry. I've given up my privilege of being part of your family. Treat me as one of your hired laborers. problem is here. He still wants to earn his keep. His response, his solution, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, so make me one of your hired laborers, is is what we call here religious legalism. We come to God with our plans to earn his acceptance, earn his welcome. Religion is the default setting for all human prodigals. And what they need is to be told that that is not possible. You see, he couldn't earn himself back into his father's good graces. 
because actually the only path that was available to him if we were to go by the letter of the law is for him to be taken to the elders at the city gate. There is no earning. But he still thinks he can dig himself out of this hole. Religion is still what he thinks will enable his overture and make it attractive to his dad. If I do this, God will like me. If I do this, God will approve of me. Do you hear that anywhere in this world? <laughs> do you hear this anywhere in your own heart? Oh, I'm going to do my quiet time this week, Lord. You understand that this legalistic orientation is woven into you. It's from Genesis chapter 3. It's a, it's a seed that is spread, you know, kind of like, I don't know if any of you are watching the Rings of Power, and I don't want your opinion, okay? But in, I'm watching it. And in this, you constantly see the influence of, Sa it's Lord of the Rings, but it's a prequel. And you see the influence of Sauron being described visually with the oozing of this darkness into the actual geography of the maps. And that's what this has done. This legalistic orientation that I can somehow behave in such a way, perform in such a way as to earn the affection, to earn the approval of God, is, is, is just kind of leaking into everything in our culture. And Jesus is saying something profound into the face of that lie. And I want you to hear it. Verse 20, so he set out and came to his father. This is the act which saves him. Not the planning, not the preparation, but the walking. Repentance is a word picture. You're walking in one direction and you turn and you walk in the opposite. Metanoia. To turn and walk in the opposite direction. So he set out to come to his father. That's where salvation begins. That's it. That's the moment. There's not a special prayer. There's a change of direction. But when he was a long way off, his father saw him. Okay. Now, many of you will be familiar with this, but I still am going to unpack it so that the revelation is fresh for you this morning. Okay? So... The son's coming with the expectation that he's going to have to come and work his tail off so that his father's fiery hatred for him, for the dishonor he brought to him, will somehow be satisfied and he will allow the son to simply live in the compound in the, the laborer's quarters. Okay, this is, what, this is the image in the son's mind as he's coming. But then it says this, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. What's required for that to happen? Someone tell me. What? He had to be looking out for him. Every day. Do you understand that's the posture of your God? For your friends? For you? He's always going, are they coming? Is that them? Is that them? It's, this is the posture of your God towards you. Is that the God you worship? It says that. Then it says this. And felt compassion for him. So his father sees him. This is the guy that just said, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. I'm out of here. Goes to another country. All the elders at the city gate, all the villagers around him are like, this is an honor-shame culture. He has brought such shame and dishonor on his family. Yeah? And when his first emotion in seeing his boy, what would be your emotion? I'm not sure it would be compassion. It would certainly be mixed at the very minimal. And it's compassion. Now, the Greek word for compassion, and I've said this before, is the Greek word splankthna. And it, it describes a reality that is like it sounds. It is the twisting of the intestines with emotion. He is bent over in agony in feeling empathy and compassion for his boy. His, twist, his insides twist at the image of this rebellious glutton and drunkard of a son. 
Does that, is that reflected in common Christian preaching in our culture? Is that Christianity in the understanding of your friends at work? That's a miracle. I just, I mean, I, I wish I could see light bulbs going off. Because this is a revelation. This is the nature of God. Jesus is revealing to the teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees, what his father's like. They aren't listening. I hope we are. Okay. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. I've said this many times. For a man of a certain age to run was shaming because he'd have to lift up his robes and reveal his legs. These were all cultural taboos. And the father blasts right through all of those taboos because he's got to get to his boy soon as possible. And when he gets to him, it's not, you jerk, you have shamed me, you idiot. Do you realize how people look at us when we go into town? No. He embraces him and he kisses him. The embrace and the kiss is something that you and I are meant to live in every day of our lives. And what happens is you will lose the joy. You will lose the passion that is the movement of Jesus if you do not live every day in the embrace and the kiss of your loving Father. That's the normal Christian life. Verse 21. And the son said to him, he's like, okay. He's prepared his speech, and he starts his speech, yeah? And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So, so far, so good, yeah? He's delivering the speech well. He hasn't stumbled. Verse 22, but the father, he cuts him off. He won't let him tell the next bit. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The next bit was, make me one of your hired servants, right? He doesn't let him even get to it. But the father said to his slaves, quick, bring out the best robe. Put it on him. The best robe was the father's robe. It would have been the finest quality, the finest threads. Now, he's in rags, rags that have been in pig slop. And he's putting his robe on top of that. Do you understand? That's a picture of the righteousness of Christ that's put on you. If you have yielded your life to Jesus, if you have turned towards home right now, when the Father looks at you, he sees his robe of perfect righteousness on you. He doesn't see the pig poo defiled clothing that you wear. The second thing is this. He says this, put a ring on his finger. This was a signet ring. This ring signified his authority. That meant that son could now act in his father's stead in business. What? Don't you even need to retrain him? Doesn't he need to go through a welcome class first so we can make sure that he knows to tithe? Yeah? He puts sandals on his feet. Why does he put sandals on his feet? That's very important because one of the greatest distinctions between slaves and family were were, were was footwear. Slaves were barefoot. You're no slave. Put sandals on his feet as quickly as possible. And then he says, bring the fat and calf. Let's eat and celebrate. I think the Christian life should be most defined by its celebration. We don't throw near enough parties as a church. We need to throw more. We need to throw more. I don't know what that looks like. I would love your imagination to begin to engage with us in thinking about how we can party more. But this story is worthy of celebration every single day. We don't need a reason. We don't need a holiday. We don't even need good weather. Now, I just want to bring into land here quickly by talking about the older son. This is the guy that did everything right. And I just want to draw out a couple points, okay? First of all, let's just verse 25. 
I'm just going to read this quickly. Now, his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, the servant said to the bro older brother, your brother has come home, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out. Again, again, the son's a doofus. The other son now is a doofus. And what does the father have to do? Be the bigger man and provide the initiative. He goes out. And he, it's just, it's so childish, isn't it? It's kind of like he's throwing a toddler tantrum. And the father goes out and says, what's the problem, son? <clears throat> Bum, 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 lost my place, began pleading with him. Not only did he come out, he didn't do it begrudgingly. He pleads, please come and be a part of our celebration. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you never gave me a young goat so that I might celebrate with your friends. First of all, the oldest son wasn't serving his father. He was serving the family. The family of which he was going to become the head when the father passes away. He was literally serving himself. He didn't understand that this was something that was his. He didn't understand his part in this. That it was just as much his to own. He didn't own it personally. He was performing it for the approval externally. You see the religious legalism here? The reality is when we lay our lives down, when we serve to the point when we're exhausted, the movement of Jesus, it's not you being used, it's you being deployed in something that you were given the privilege of being a part of. It's worthy of your exhaustion. It's worthy of your sweat. It's worthy of your money. It's worthy of your time. But you've got to let it be yours first. And this son hadn't yet. And then he says, yet you never gave me a young goat. And I just want to say this. It was already his. He could have done that at any moment. It was all his. He could have at any, one, any point thrown a party for his friends and, uh, you know, barbecued the goat. But he chose a life of without because he failed to understand the privilege of sonship. And the father says in verse 31, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Friends, I don't know who you identify with, but I want you to know that you are a part of something here in this thing called Christianity, this person called Jesus that is more beautiful than you can even imagine. He is better than you hoped. You may think he's pretty cool. He's better. He's better. And you will not be contagious until that lands for you. He's running down the road toward us every day. He's looking for us, any sign of us, and running towards us. We live with his royal gowns on our shoulders, his sandals on our feet, his signet ring on our hand. This is the good news that your friends need to hear. Why is Christianity unique? That's why. Will you guys stand up?